Hi, my name is Peter Royal. I'm a software engineer at Netflix, and I'm here to tell you a story about my journey in learning about observability practices and the value of integrating them deeply into my development work, uh, how that has helped me in the past, and some stories about how it has helped me with my current engagement. My first contact with distributed tracing was contemporaneous with Google releasing their paper on Dapper back uh, around 2010-ish. And at the time, I was working in the financial industry at a high-frequency trading firm. We were building new system to trade on exchanges the firm hadn't previously done business with. And we were very concerned about overall latency, tick to trade, so to speak, where we care about the duration between when we receive information and then when our computers act on it. The way this was done is we had these packet capture devices on the egress and ingress links and those were linked to GPS clock clocks. To calculate, that gave us the end-to-end -end latency, and then to um, the application would then build a causality chain inside of it with timestamps as it went through different processing steps that we could then use to segment that overall time to see how much each individual step took. While latency analysis was the initial goal, we also quickly found that having the sequence of causalities captured from within the application was an excellent debugging tool to track and understand what the internals of the system were using. As it happened, we actually went years using this and other specific probes to monitor the health of our system. It was entirely domain-specific monitoring rather than relying on any sort of external metrics such as load averages or other things that you might capture about the process. By integrating this monitoring deep into the application itself, by essentially monitoring the application's heartbeat, we had a general idea of how the overall system was performing. I'm happy to share more stories about everything that we did at this time, but this is really stage setting for what I'm going to do in the future. I'm Peter Royal. I've been a professional software developer for over two decades now across a number of domains. My career has been a smaller number of longer engagements, which I feel has uh, prevented or presented me with an eye towards development practices that have longer term benefits. I've been fortunate enough to be present for the initial construction of several systems and have been able to see them mature and provide continuing value. For the past several years, I've been employed by Netflix and have been helping build out tools to um, help our business partners that are doing content production. This talk is about stories about what we've done and how that has helped us. And my intention is to inspire you to con consider doing the same within your domains. In early 2020, I helped start a new project. I had many ideas about how to approach this body of work, but the one that's relevant today is how to observe what the system was doing. I had been following Charity on Twitter for a while at this point, and there were two of her, I consider them repeating themes were in my mind. The first one was that observability comes within, comes from within, so to speak. And this one really resonated with me because it, it was directly aligned with my prior experience working in the trading industry, is that is essentially uh, what we had done. This, um, the second one was the trickier one, and this isn't exactly the, the framing now, but it is important for what we were doing. And basically capturing everything that might seem interesting up front. Um, don't think up too hard about interesting, just if it seems like it's interesting, capture it and, you know, record that off and, and use it for later. Although this one had me scratching my head a little bit because I was having trouble about figuring out how exactly this fit into some of my other points. Other things that we have going on um, that are relevant to the story is that Netflix are really able to build upon the shoulders of giants. We have a lot of excellent infrastructure that's present, and that's some amazing toolings for capturing metrics and analyzing traces. The broad strokes of what we're doing is we're building services that have GraphQL APIs that compose into a single federated graph. Um, this is on top of Spring Boot, and at the moment, Spring Boot directly exposes the Sleuth, um, Sleuth, uh, I'm sorry, Spring Boot Sleuth API is for tracing, and that directly exposes Brave's API. And, each one of these links goes into to more detail about what we're doing, but this is stuff that we're able to build upon. As a development process, um, one of the things I like to do is limit the third-party dependencies that extrude themselves into my domain code. Often, all of their functionality isn't really needed, and the desired surface area is much better constrained to something that I'm able to control. And this is a practice from experience. When we was working in the trading industry, we had 
you know, very finely tuned the API they were using using to capture data. And the same practice um, also applies by managing the way that those inter those dependencies intrude themselves upon your domain code. You have more control over how changes there affect your code. I can manage the changes from a dependency in one place rather than having it scattered throughout my code. For the system that I've been working on, it's event driven. Um, all throughout. And as part of this, we have this general envelope structure that contains our messages. And this provides a common place for metadata, such as unique ID, timestamp, who made it, the, the contents of the envelope itself, and most importantly, this causality, um, which is what we term this observability table. You could think of it as the um, the little stamp the, the post office puts on it saying, you know, who has, you know, where where has this letter been? And this was the deep hook that we added into, into our work. Basically, any internal code that's involved in our event processing has access to this causality. And it's a very, very simple API. It's akin to the span customizer or you know, the Honeycomb's event where you can just kind of drop whatever you want in. But we only exposed exactly what we needed and also were able to enforce the way it was used as well as far as naming conventions or other constraints that we wanted to have. And early on in development, this turned out to be useful. So one of the limitations of our internal tooling is we don't have a unification between metrics and traces. And this is kind of a legacy of Netflix's journey. Our streaming service operates at a massive scale, and metrics are the primary way to observe the health of that because it's, it's the most feasible thing given what we're doing. A corollary of that is if something needs to be looked at in depth, you can turn tracing on for those requests that are of interest, which is awesome. There's this open source project called Mantis that we um, we have um, put out that, that helps us do that and could help you do it too. But this you need to have confidence that the anomaly you saw will recur in order for this approach to work. But we're doing business applications and business applications are different. Rather than requests per second, we're requests per minute. If you don't capture something by the time when it happened, it might not happen again. So in this case, capturing everything up front is a feasible problem. But you still have the problem of linking specific metric anomalies you see to specific events that actually cause them. And I've been thinking about this gap, and that is part of what led me to Honeycomb the value proposition of being able to see those trends as far as what is happening and seeing an anomaly and drilling down to that specific request really spoke to me. And I wanted to see how could I bring that into my service. However, at the same time, I'm also squaring that you know, second theme with charities, which was a single wide event per request versus the common tracing model of multiple spots. And this is where owning that abstraction became useful. As an experiment, I tried dual writing my traces into both our internal tracing system as well as generating that single wide event for Honeycomb. And this was all hidden behind our internal abstraction and everything worked fine. So we, we built this and, and kept going. Except it didn't really work out. Once we started flowing requests through, we realized that this was clunky. Our internal tooling, you know, cool, we could see the trace, everything was expected, but Honeycomb's view wasn't ideal. We had multiple duration fields and it just, it didn't work right with the product. At this time, I came across the Beeline library and how it integrated with Spring Cloud and it was, aha, I could actually be representing this as traces in Honeycomb as well. So this was a simplification of what I was doing, but because I had owned that abstraction, it didn't perturb the rest of my code. So now we got the desired display in each system. We could you know, use the benefit of each tool and the trace IDs were the same. So I could see something in Honeycomb, bring it to our inter internal tooling or vice versa. With this in place, we continued our development, marching towards feature completion and acceptance testing with our users. However, unintentionally, we had built the system in such a way that it could blow itself up, metaphorically. We were able to semi-reliably cause our Postgres instance to go into recovery mode. Before we had realized the scope of the problem, this was awesome because this was a great opportunity to invest in the resiliency of the system. We had it, made it automatically recover from these failures, but it's undesirable. Um, 
one of the things that we did while trying to debug this was we enabled the Java Flight Recorder, which is a continuous profiler in its low overhead mode. It didn't end up being terribly useful in giving us insight to what was going on, but it was, you know, on the tin, it says it was low overhead. So we just left it running in the background in case something interesting happened in the future, we would have already been correcting that data. We were finally able to narrow down the problem to a naive design decision that was interacting poorly with some of our larger inputs. So then we went in, time to fix it. We know what to do. Because the system was mo mostly working and we were reworking a core part of the calculation, it was time to up our testing game. Very broadly, we were taking something that was being computed on demand to being computed up front. And as part of that, we now cared about all the specific places or all the specific interactions that would need to rely or that would cause the information to need to be recomputed. This was now a new set of problems that our tests hadn't previously covered. As part of this, we decided to introduce stateful property-based tests for our API. As a super succinct explanation, the test suite picks a random action in the system, performs that, validates the expected output, and then picks another random action and continues on. This has been great because it has found a bunch of edge cases that would have been awful to discover in production. The flip side is this is stochastic coverage. The more iteration the tests perform, the greater the confidence in we've actually covered the entire state space. But the more iterations we perform, the slower the build is. And we weren't happy with our balance of the number of iterations versus the build time that we were having at the moment. I was preparing to add timing information to our test to see where the time was being spent when I had an insight in the shower that you know, one of those people were, you know, the, the water pouring over your, your mind just, you know, your, your thoughts can drift. And I realized well, we had already instrumented our application and we're comfortable analyzing that for when it's running deployed. In big air quotes, all we really needed to do was have our tests participate in that. Conceptually, each test iteration is a trace. So I was able to add a decorator to the test suite to wrap each one of our randomly generated actions in span. I turned on trace reporting and voila, I had a trace with a span for action. And then inside of that span was all the work the system was already doing. And I could use all the tooling we had already done to understand why my test suite was slow. I was all prepared to add this custom integration, but reusing that work was it ended up being a huge time saver. We were able to reduce the time for each iteration, and then we use that time saving to strike the balance that we were comfortable with between total build time and the number of iterations. This is also where frequent builds help too, because every time we run a build, it's another n iterations of the test suite. So these things compound in order to give us confidence in the work that we were doing. In the end, we were able to solidly improve system stability, and we had given it a performance boost as well. Another round of acceptance tests was underway, and I was idly browsing our latency metrics, just looking to see what was there. And I saw some weird outliers in seemingly arbitrary portions of framework code prior to the request entering my code. So what I wanted to do was saying, could I try to isolate this duration so I could graph it irrespective of how long the request took? And Thinking through the model, Brave's model is span-centric. So at any time you have, this is what the current span is. But I really wanted to get a hook onto the parent span to understand what the timestamp of when the request actually started. I realized that this is actually available due to how the integration was done. So I realized that if I could put an annotation on that span, my code that reports that event to Honeycomb could calculate the time difference between the annotation and the root of the span. And given that duration, I could then graph that to see what is the distribution of these times. And I added this, and also it worked, except it was blowing up for a bunch of requests. Why? And I was now starting to pull my hair up because based on everything I understood about how the framework code worked, what I had done should work in all cases, except it wasn't. So this is where prior work came to the rescue again. When I had done the original work of generating events for the annotations, I propagated all of the spans tags onto the annotation. 
This meant that the annotations that contained the duration of how long it had been until the, um, the, the request entered my code had another useful tag, the HTTP path. And this ended up being the clue to realize that it was a specific endpoint prior to reaching my code that was causing the misbehavior. I added some more diagnostic tags to narrow this down, and I ended up finding two bugs in the framework that we were using. One was an unintentional sharing of data across requests, and the second was a failure to initialize some data for requests to some paths. Once I was able to fix that, I then had a clean data set that actually showed my other problem, these unexpected latencies that occurred in the framework prior to entering my code. I had some excellent help from our platform team trying to you know, add in different intermediate traces or intermediate um, annotations to the framework code to try to narrow this down. And at this point, somebody else that hadn't been working closely with us stepped in and said, have you tried disabling Java Flight Recorder? Remember, we turned that on at this point, it had been months ago, in terms of, and we were trying to diagnose something else. And at the time, we thought, what's the harm? Except that was the cause of all the latencies. In this graph, you can see all the noise there. And then when everything flattens out, that's when we turn that off. We saw this dramatic result when we flipped that. And this was very eye-opening in that there really is no free lunch. Even though this was the low overhead mode of this continuous profiler, there still was a cost to our service when we actually looked at our latencies. At this point, the system started to move into production. And one practice we decided to start doing as a team was to meet at the start of the week um, as part of our on-call handoff, as you will, and collectively review what our different observability tools had captured over the past week. The initial goal of this was to build a mental baseline of what normal behavior looks like. So when the inevitable incident occurs, we aren't chasing something that may appear funny at the time, but is in fact normal. And after a couple of weeks of this, we found something. Uh, a pattern we saw was in this latency distribution of calls to another service. The frequency of the volume of the request should scale with the data in the system. And there hadn't been a dramatic change in the data volume. So when we saw this chart where it spiked, we knew that there was something curious going on. Because we had been capturing this data, we were able to zoom out and realize that the, the variations in here weren't new. This was not a new phenomenon. This count should be stable or slowly increasing, not any of these wild swings that we were seeing. What's going on is there is a call that we have that is batched. And in a single request, we can ask data for n elements at a time. At the time when we had originally done this, we had added the size of that batch as a tag to the causality data that we were capturing. We had no idea you know, whether or not we would use that in the future, but because it was something interesting that the code was doing, we just stuffed it into our um, causality payload for later recording. So what we did is we were able to add a derived column that bucketed this view, and all of a sudden some patterns started to jump out. When we then added another grouping by the application version, that was enough for us to realize what the cause of this pattern was. One of the features of our system is it has the ability to recreate the database schema that's used to service reads. When this happens, this was causing a change in the input rate to the component that's making the RPC calls. When the system starts up normally, that the component that's managing RPC calls gets all of its state very quickly and it's doing fewer large batches. But when we end up rematerializing our database view, it's a much slower trickle into that component, which led to more batches that were smaller. And that's the, the pattern that you can see in the chart. Normally, it should be that dense blue that's at the bottom, and that indicates deploys that happened when we were in that steady state. And in between all that other noise is, you know, some of it is going to be, you know, users dynamically adding things into the system that will kind of tweak the batches. But um, this is work that doesn't normally happen on every deploy. So we were able to make a change to the system that changed it so the batch size will be rush, roughly constant, irrespective of how quickly this component received its input. So this didn't result in an operational problem. 
Um, but it was undesirable system behavior that we were able to fix. And we saw it because we were essentially just looking under rocks to see what was there to, to understand what was going on. And because we had captured this contextual information at the time, we were able to see the longer term pattern and address a fix. And this really validated this practice of just looking at our tooling as a regular course of understanding what was going on inside the system. And this is what brings me back to a, a metaphor about cabling that I used in the, the, the abstract for this talk. When doing construction, when the walls are open, that's the ideal time to run wires to where you want networking your power. But in addition to running the wires, before the walls are sealed up, a pull string will be left behind. So in the future, even though the wall is sealed, you have a mechanism to pull new wires through that same conduit. And that's how I think about my software. When we started, we put this abstraction deeply into our domain code. So it was available everywhere that we needed it to be. And that acts as both that conduit and pull string as a place that we could attach information to that at the time might seem useful. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't. But we also have these hooks in place that we can add additional, if there's new things that we want to add, we already have a place to hang them. And while a new system might be the best time to do that, the second best time to do that is now. You really need to figure out what is appropriate for your domain, create that foundation, and then start weaving it throughout your system. This is one of those practices that your future self will really thank you for. I hope you've enjoyed my tales, and I hope that I've inspired you to deeply incorporate observability into some of your own practices. Thank you. Thank you for giving the talk. It's always interesting to, as mentioned, figure out how Netflix thinks about hipster monitoring. But coming at it from the other side, how much of what you do at Netflix apply and what you talk about applies to larger organ sorry, not larger. There aren't many that much larger in terms of engineering prowess, but in terms of other organizations where you're not Netflix, where you don't have some of the best engineers in the world working there, although most places have someone around who thinks they are. And you're, let's also be very clear here, that combines with the failure domain of if Netflix does something that breaks something, the failure mode is, oh, someone can't watch a movie for 20 minutes. And yes, they might ride in the streets for that, but it's not the same blast domain, blast radius as someone not taking down the ATM networks, for example. That is true. Um, I agree with that. But what I am helping to work at Netflix is, I feel, more applicable to many other companies because we're actually building business applications to help our internal studio do their work. So we're on the content production side rather than the content presentation side of the stream. So the same way you have that parallel between the ATM network and streaming, where you know both are things that people expect to work that have different failure modes. Um, the result of our failure, like if our the systems that I work on fail, it's more of the the humans are unable to to use the tools to do their jobs. And I think that a lot of other companies are doing that sort of thing. Like if you're building a you know some sort of internal business application that somebody's using, that's very similar to what we're doing. And yes, we are able to borrow a lot of the infrastructure that the company has built that, um, that we you know use to to support the streaming the streaming product that we have. So there's there are all these great tools. At the same time, um, you know there's sometimes they are not perfect for what business applications are doing. We care about every request being bad. Um, if you know if a user is trying to you know submit an invoice to pay, they care if if that specific request fails. It's not the same as I'm just going to hit play again um, because the video didn't start on my TV. It seems on some level, that this is sort of the problem with, with every environment as described in a conference talk, where yeah. it, what you talk about in, in, in isolation sounds awesome. The idea right. of even the basic stuff you know, of, of yeah. tracing yeah. and requests through yeah. the environments. But you take a look at a lot of shops and they look at their environment and everyone believes that their environment is a disaster burning tire fire. One of the things I learned about through consulting is right. that every environment is in fact a burning disaster tire fire once you peel back the covers. No, yeah. nothing is perfect. No one's happy. But right. the perception then is, well, we have to fix a bunch of other things that are much higher priority than gaining a visibility into something that doesn't help us fix the fire du jour. Okay. How, given that, that 
as we, you do, it has always been an iterative process. At what point like, did you ever step back, look around and see this, this vast sea of everything humming along swimmingly and working just perfectly? Aha, now it is time to embark upon an observability journey. I, I kind of think it never worked that way. What, what, did the, what did the rollout of this approach start to look like? It was when I, so yes, like you, when you, how do you then to decide to embark upon that journey? If you're not, if you don't have anything new that you're doing, it can be hard to do that. And that, that's kind of how I use this as the initial wedge. We were starting to build a new service and for my own benefit and for our team's benefit, that's when we started to add these observability hooks. We added it very early when we started to design the internals of the system. And then we're able to reap the benefits of that during the development process, even before we had put it into production. So at the same time, like, yes, there's there's never a, a perfect time. Like, like it, I find always start now. And to the extent that everything is a burning tire fire sometimes, yes, every every place has, its problems, but if the, it's the type of thing, the, the sooner that you can put it in, in place that you can, you can then start to reap the benefits. I'm, I kind of draw an analogy with that and like other coding practices that we do, like, you know, you want to, you always want to minimize your tech debt. You know, you want to make sure that like your code's formatted and you know, you're not doing other things that are obviously wrong. And I'm trying to kind of steer this observability information kind of into that best practice that you want to incorporate that early into what you're doing, because again, you, you just continue to reap those benefits over time. A uh, question came in on Slack from Mike English, uh, building on what I just asked. Yes, that's me. Uh, how do you choose where to apply Ollie or observability or hipster monitoring first? Uh, do you drive from top level metrics from an availability or rebuffer rate or something like that? Because my approach was always, I went bottom up, which spoiler, doesn't really work so well. It's every time something bad happens, oh, let's make sure that we alarm every time a disk starts to get above 80% and that will drive you batty if you're not careful. So we kind of did both. Um, we, we had wired, information capture in deep into the system. But initially the only real health that we had was checking to make sure that the system was up. And it was once that we had, you know, had kind of gotten everything working, we actually added a synthetic check to the system. And that is now our primary monitoring. So what that is, is there's a external service that just, you know, pings, essentially pings the system and does a, you know, a write through the entire write path and is able to verify that you know it, it's really just a counter that you know that counter went up by one and that gives us not just the health of is the system up but is the is the entire cycle that's happening inside the system working so we we did start we did start with more of that metrics as the health but once we you know once we had a certain maturity in the system we added this other check that actually checks at the more of the the actual work the system is doing that actually makes sure that the database is healthy and the other the other parts of the system that care about so that that gives us a sense that when the users use it will they actually get the experience they want and obviously we can't sit and sit there you know adding pennies to somebody's invoice um as a check for that so we had to make up something um but it's very much a this there's this synthetic check that well, we can tell you don't work at content. aws yes <laughs> Now, that's part of it. I mean, I'm mostly joking, but my entire world lives around the economics of things like this, where it's when you're when you're something like a cloud provider and you're charging on a consumption basis or you're a vendor where you wind up building a model unit economics that works out. What I think people lose sight of is that internally, when you start doing things that have observability stories to it, there is a cost to this, not just in terms of the actual uh, resources being used and by resources. I never use that to mean people, but also the people as well, the, the folks rolling this out. How do you find that getting a culture of focusing on understanding to the degree that you have what's going on in your environment makes sense because that, I found a lot of shops. That's an incredibly uphill battle. It is kind of related to the economics and staffing because you, I want to get systems running to the point where they, you know, it's kind of a spinning top that you just can kind of keep going in perpetual motion, absent any other perturbations such that as a developer, I don't want to, I don't want to bake in that, you know, pessimistic career security of the system requiring me in order to do that maintenance to keep it going because I mean really I'd rather work on something new but if I can't I can't work on something new unless I know that my prior work is stable and functional and by practicing these observability practices I know that what I have done 
will continue working and you know it will kind of alert me if if there's a problem and i can turn my attention back to it but then i can kind of scale myself as a resource um, across multiple systems um, because you know i've i've built that stuff in a way that it doesn't require that constant upkeep um, that it's the the observability that's present lets me dig back in and understand what's wrong when something will eventually go wrong but that's a exceptional state rather than the steady state our, our final question comes from Jill San Lewis, uh, that, and she says, curious, they say, curious, I am assuming Netflix is a polyglot shop. Does Netflix do observability, at least how it's been described in your talk, per application level, or is there some common layer, like maybe a sidecar, to standardize the observability approach in the org? And I love the question. It's how much of what you just talked about as conference wear is really the very direct, blunt distillation of that? Yes. Um, so we, we are a polyglot shop. The studio that the area that I work in is also very much a Java shop. We are the business applications that we're building were standardized on a Spring Boot stack. Um, we're using um, Spring Boot's um, sleuth component that writes traces out um, using Zipkin and Brave. So that's all standard um, that's that's collecting that. Um, other observe some other system information is collected um, via via sidecars. Um, but a lot of it is common. We're trying to go towards the common off the shelf interfaces that a lot of other systems use because it does unlock some of that polyglot nature. And it also leverages information and knowledge that new individuals that come to the company have. We don't want you to come to Netflix and require to learn a bunch of Netflix specific interfaces and how you build code. The what's available in the open source world has you know, adapters for so, so many things. So if you can use that and then just point it at our infrastructure to to capture that um, on the back end, you're kind of free to use what you want in your service. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. Really appreciate your, your time and effort giving the talk.